the last six months in the tech universe has been explosive. Since ChatGPT was released on November 30, 2022, the field of information and communication technology seems much bigger, more exciting, and also more dangerous. With so-called generative AI or artificial intelligence breaking through, the talk has swung between extremes of utopian hope and dystopian fear. Say goodbye to the drudgery of much of our required writing, AI will write all of that. But also say hello to insidious deepfakes and other forms of disinformation. AI will fabricate all of that too and in an instant. What to do? And more crucially, how to think about all this? Good evening. I'm John Neri, and you are in the public square. In the Philippines, the Analytics Association of the Philippines, or AAP, has helped take the lead in AI-related issues. Last week, together with the Department of Information and Communication Technology, it again convened the National Summit on AI and Analytics. Two leading data analysts who helped make that summit happen join us tonight. Michelle Alarcon is president of the Analytics Association of the Philippines, and Dominic Doc Ligot, who has joined us before, is executive director of Data Ethics PH, among other responsibilities. Good evening, Michelle and Doc. Thank you for joining us in the public square. Thanks for having us. Thank you. Uh, Michelle, let me start with you. How did yeah. the release of ChatGPT and then the boom in generative AI impact on your preparations for this year's national summit? It was a huge impact. In fact, we, we had to um, rethink the usual content that we have, mm -hmm. but the format is has really been, uh, every year we've been doing the, the summit since, I believe, 20, 2019, 2018. Mm -hmm. The format has been to have discussions with the public sector, private sector, academic sector, and then mm -hmm. specific targeting to uh, targeted to students. Mm -hmm. right. So it's the same format, but the content was so much uh, disrupted, as, as you mentioned, because um, there uh, ourselves even, you know, uh, among the board of trustees, uh, including DOC and, and other practitioners, um, we also had to sort of pre-align on our own understanding of what's going on, what's going to happen. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And we had a lot of pocket sessions before we even came up with the final agenda. Mm -hmm. Particularly if you saw in the summit uh, in day two, mm -hmm. there was a panel around um, not just finance, which is our usual mm -hmm. you know, traditional mm -hmm. AI analytics uh, adopters um, in the industry. There is an inclusion of a creatives panel. Uh, because they were um, heavily disrupted as well, or you know, people from basically uh, representing uh, the creative industries from game developers mm -hmm. to animators mm -hmm. to book writers, um, and uh, we haven't heard their side, you know, even in the past summits. Yeah. Um, so that was definitely a new panel, but we needed to make sure that we know wh where they stand and what they need and how the association can help them before we even uh, go to the summit itself. So those types of preparations needed to be done um, maybe way ahead, no? So maybe um, even working with, uh, with the public sector when it comes to policy and planning preparations or giving them inputs mm -hmm. in the summit, which we hope to launch. Uh, but obviously there wasn't enough time and uh, not a lot of resolutions uh, from those discussions that we were not able to really come up with a formal recommendation during the summit. But as you can see, things have been really evolving on a day-to-day -day basis. Right. I mean, how can you even plan for a big event like that and, and have a fixed content, sort of? But I think overall it went well, but you can you can also attest to that if, if you attended. You know, yes, I did well. attend it uh, in person on the first day and yeah. online uh, on the second day. Uh, Doc, your keynote presentation uh, at the summit drove home the point that as a society, we are at the crossroads as far as AI is concerned. What are the principal issues regarding AI? I don't think we'll have enough time to address all of the issues, but yeah. I think it would be nice to have an overview. What's, what, should be we, what should we be thinking about when it comes to AI? Yeah, maybe on a high level, you can group it into three. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> the immediate issues uh, pertain to jobs. Jobs, education, mm -hmm. as a teacher, you, you see this. 
and kind of the long-standing issues relating to data like disinformation, privacy, mm -hmm. that's one bucket. And then on the far end of it, the new stuff, we're hearing a lot about ethics and safety, which may be very alien to most people. Mm -hmm. It's kind of very Hollywood. But it is closer <laughs> to reality now because these kinds of AI can automate tasks and if we don't train them properly, they can be harmful. And then I think the, the third bucket of issues is something that more, more the business people want to hear about. Like, how does this benefit business? How does this benefit productivity? How does this benefit... Uh, you know, uh, industry. Mm -hmm. No one seems to talk about that a lot, but I think that's also a very important thing to consider. Yeah, I, I did catch uh, a particular session where they were talking about how you, they can like make BPO uh, BPOs more efficient using yeah. AI, for instance. Um, I, I wanted to ask uh, both of you. So AI, in the sense of the generative AI, mm -hmm. uh, since uh, Chat GPT. Um, is new in the sense that we have to establish baselines. We have to make definitions. Mm -hmm. right? yeah. At the same time, it's urgent. I mean, yeah. there's some things that are happening now that we might regret if we don't stop it or if we don't uh, put uh, guardrails up and so on. So new and urgent. Mm -hmm. How do we strike the right balance? I mean... First, let me ask you in your own capacities, personal capacities mm -hmm. in your own uh, respective uh, groups, and then with AAP. Mm. Oh, okay. Usually, not do not separate those. Okay. Groups, but right. but no, it is it is a it is a fair question because um, each one, each individual is impacted the same way. I mean, it's not because I'm an academic instructor. You know, it's I I am less at less risk than, mm -hmm. than someone who is working on the development side, right? Mm -hmm. So we're all affected because we are all users. Um, maybe not everyone can be creators of these algorithms, which, by the way, is also part of the discussion, right, mm -hmm. in terms of AI safety. Uh, but what we really see um, to be urgent as a step is, uh, first, really awareness and education, right? So if uh, people just panic and keep on, you know, some, some groups may say, we need regulations ASAP. Mm -hmm. So should we just copy the one from Europe or the one from the U.S. or wherever, right, our neighboring countries? I think it's, uh, it's, uh, it, it will not help, right? We need to understand uh, where we are um, in the Philippines, how we are using um, data, how we are really ready for AI, mm -hmm. and uh, see what is fit for us, right? It's good to understand what is out there, what is being done in the different countries, and, and, the, and you know, really keep up to date on the ongoing discussions. Um, and then we have to come up with our own um, set of, I don't want to call it regulations or policies, but maybe just principles. And, and I believe the AAP, um, well, thankfully not uh, shameless plug, but uh, the industry associations are, are there for, for these particular purposes, right? Um, so we understand um, setting up the association five years ago that it is an evolving technology. We started just tackling analytics and data science, mm -hmm. but behind that, of course, the core is data, mm -hmm. and then we know that it is AI. Mm -hmm. There's even that debate that, okay, should we make it AI Association of the Philippines at the start, right? Because we know that it's, that's, that's the track, right? Mm -hmm. But uh, being an association, it doesn't mean that, you know, everything falls on our shoulders. But uh, what, is, what is good is we have established that ecosystem that we call that uh, is composed of private public sector and academic sector practitioners so that this awareness that is more urgent, at least uh, from, from um, where I see things happening, right? Um, this education is now um, really engaging all the stakeholders, um, and the definitions could vary, you know, from from different perspectives. So we are here to make sure that everyone is heard, and that uh, there is awareness, uh, at least the basic, no, the the baselines are there. But looking at um, the addressing the need for regulations and safety and, and all that, um, it it seems like the more practical approach right now with lack of any regulation in place is maybe um, still convening as a, as a group mm -hmm. and then um, looking at um, micro regulatory environments I think that's that's what they're called so schools maybe can can mm -hmm. come up with their own 
policies for now, share what's work, what doesn't work within their own associations. Mm -hmm. And the AAP is there to actually, you know, guide them, guide them because that's, that's again, you know, that's, that's why we do these things, right? So I think it's, you know, it's, it's still a lot that we can do together. Mm -hmm. We just started with the summit um, trying to sort of elicit mm -hmm. uh, these suggestions and uh, hearing from different perspectives from uh, the representatives there. Yeah, I was struck by the fact that there were, in fact, different stakeholders. No? Yeah. Uh, and the government was there in, in force. Uh, maybe later we can talk about the, the kinds of roles we expect the private sector, the public, the, which parts of the private sector, and, and the government uh, will play yeah. uh, moving forward. But, uh, Doc, uh, how do we strike the balance between new and urgent. So some of the urgent things you, you said, you know, there's an, there's an immediate uh, basket or bucket, like we have to attend to these, but there's also some long-term things that if we don't want to be left behind in our region yeah. and in the world, we need to attend to also. How do we strike that balance? I think if we step back a bit, there are two changes in cadence about AI that we have felt. Number one, it's very pervasive, unlike okay. in the past, you need to be some sort of a scientist or engineer to actually mm -hmm. use AI. Now you just log on, anyone can do it. Mm -hmm. yeah. And then the barrier to adoption is very low. You don't need to know programming, mm -hmm. you know. That's why I likened it to kind of the phenomena of automobiles. Mm -hmm. You don't need to be a mechanic to drive a car and vice versa. Mm -hmm. And then the second uh, aspect to it is it's pervasive and it's also generative. In the past, AI was used to interpret data. Now AI is used to create data, and that's a very different dynamic. It changes the way people mm -hmm. treat data to begin with. Uh, it is best seen in the graphics and phot photography industry. Mm -hmm. uh, before, you just you needed existing photos to fake them. Now AI generates completely original photographs in whatever style you want. Mm -hmm. So the urgency... We'll, we'll have to get back to that uh, use of the word original. Yeah, yeah, or the, uh, yeah, yeah, quote and quote. Yeah. Uh -huh. So that's, I think, the where the urgency issue comes from. We're not used to AI being used in this manner mm -hmm. and pervasively, which means that we need to change the, the cadence which we deal with it. And then the broader areas of application, because the floodgates have been open, mm -hmm. no one's ever thought about kind of the extent of all of this stuff before. And that's why all these sectors are seemingly lighting up at the same time. Jobs, education, mm -hmm. privacy. Before AI was such a niche uh, subject. Now it's completely everywhere. That's what, for me, is what's driving this. Maybe we can take a step back and uh, can I ask you, uh, Doc, uh, uh, what, what are some of the basic definitions that I think we mm. should all agree on? Mm. Uh, maybe what are some of the baselines that we should measure? Yeah, well, uh, first and foremost, Generative AI is called such because it generates data. Mm -hmm. And I would say over time, that will probably be the most popular use of AI. Mm -hmm. But there's also existing AI. We call it discriminative AI. Mm -hmm. It's more to interpret data. It's more mm -hmm. to make predictions. It's actually, I would say, the AI that a lot of people don't realize is already there. It's already there. Yeah, right. It's in YouTube. It's mm -hmm. in eBay. It's on Waze. It's on Waze, my, my favorite example. So that's the basic definition. If you're creating data with AI, that's generative. And then... The other part is re really pertaining to uh, machine learning, right? The machine learning is really, if you have data, what do you do with that data? Uh, apply some sort of math formula, and it comes up with some sort of solution. There is a specific type of machine learning that I think is going to impact our lives more, mm -hmm. more often, and that's what's called reinforcement learning, which mm -hmm. is basically the AI that beat the, the best Go player or the chess players. Mm -hmm. So these are AIs that learn with repetition mm -hmm. and they learn to beat something or, or, or solve for a goal. That's actually the fundamental building block which is causing so much fear mm -hmm. but also so much possibility because now you have virtual assistants. They learn over time. They learn your habits. Uh, Self-driving cars will eventually learn your streets. Mm -hmm. That's all based on basically reinforcement learning. And that's also where the the fear of safety comes from because you can tell an algorithm to optimize in a very naive manner and it will do things that you didn't expect. You know, the, the classic example I used in the keynote was you have an AI running a hospital and you tell it, oh, minimize cancer cases. It might just decide to kill all the cancer patients. You know, something like that. You, okay. know, you need to be very I, I careful. I've, I've seen that movie before. <laughs> yeah, so we have to be very careful. And this is a long-standing problem even yeah. before ChatGPT came out. Mm -hmm. But now it's in your face. You know, uh, it's something that affects you. Like, uh, 
uh, our our friend uh, Dr. Tihanki had his CV manufactured by uh, mm -hmm. by uh, by ChatGPT to mm -hmm. his uh, no, to his disappointment. So these are things; these are problems we never thought about before. Mm -hmm. But because of its generative nature, it's it's you know uh, pervasive. It's affecting all aspects of our lifestyle, our society. Can you also very quickly also talk about hallucinations as 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 something that we must all be aware of? Well, yeah, I think one of the biggest I would say disservice that even this is open AI's fault to be honest. Mm -hmm. We likened uh, the chatbot mm -hmm. to search engines, mm -hmm. which you know you search for something, it pops up. Mm -hmm. So we're used to kind of a retrieval system process for mm -hmm. for all of these systems. These chatbots are not retrieving anything. They're actually creating new text mm -hmm. or new photos based on patterns it, it, it was trained on. Okay. And that means it's giving you something that looks probable, which without saying whether it's factual. And that's what's throwing everyone off. You know, you ask, uh, who is John Nery? It will give you a, a probable John Nery, mm -hmm. uh, assuming if your name is common enough or mm -hmm. rare enough, without knowing if it's really true. And that's why even in the, the early talks I've been doing, I actually discourage that kind of use of, of chatbots. Don't just ask it blindly. Ask it to interpret an existing piece of information or text that you're sure of. And it seems to work better that way. But you know, you can't stop people from you know, prompting mm -hmm. basically a chatbot. And this has a lot of effect, for example, in school. Mm -hmm. There was that lawyer who manufactured cases, didn't know that it was all fake. Yeah. That's the problem. We're, we're not used to this kind of, uh, you know, these habits uh, are being created as we speak with this kind of technology. Uh, Michelle, what can we do as a society to make sure that the, the urgent next steps are taken? Mm. Okay, very hard question because <laughs> um, we've been trying to actually uh, mobilize, mm -hmm. right? Uh, when back when we were just talking about analytics and data science, and uh, there were still you know ethical considerations in implementing analytics and data science, but no one was really. You know, very alarmed with it. Mm -hmm. We did tackle that as well in in how many summits mm -hmm. um, in the past, um, and uh, there are some practitioners also um, looking after ethical regulations in in uh, analytics and data science. But it's it's as you said, it's new and it's urgent because AI is just mm -hmm. here and you cannot unsee it, right? So the I think as a society, first we need to understand that um, there is. You know there is this uh, ecosystem again. I go back to that word, right? Because mm -hmm. no one sector can do, solve it on their own or attack mm -hmm. the problem on their own if it is a problem for them. So let's say it is the, the IT BPM sector, right? If if they take it up on their own um, without having, let's say, um, AI experts from the the tech industries mm -hmm. or maybe even uh, from the academic institutions, right? So it, it has to really be a, a whole country approach. So that's that's what we also presented. You know, the the what what should be the new ways of working when it comes to um, these often thrown around the term private public academe partnership, right? Mm -hmm. um, it's a favorite word also among public sector because you know uh, you you talk to one large company and you feel it's already a you know, a connection with the private sector, but really it has to be a um, uh, a mechanism that is uh, part of how we work as a country. Mm -hmm. um, maybe the early beginnings of, of this could be uh, how we did some of our in, in early programs in analytics upskilling mm -hmm. and then uh, making sure that they are employable in the private sector and then working with the public sector to form, let's say, memorandum or, or laws around, um, you know, putting this in the basic curriculum, you know, something like that. Mm -hmm. But right now, uh, we have uh, high hopes that we can also illustrate this um, and maybe just even pilot it, you know, working as a society, one whole country approach. Uh, as we work with the DTI, mm -hmm. uh, particularly the Competitiveness and Innovation Group who owns the National AI Roadmap, mm -hmm. not sure if, if you were... Mm -hmm. Uh, you've heard of the, that was launched in 2021. Mm -hmm. um, so we did announce it also in the summit that the AAP will help in the working group committee basically or to do the implementation plan of the AI roadmap. So it, uh, it is it's a plan up to now um, and it just needs execution, just needs. So that is one example of how the society can, mm -hmm. can solve this uh, or attack this. As I, I like what you said earlier about the focus on micro uh, regulatory uh, framework yeah. or approaches. 
in a way, it's uh, it really suggests itself because the problem is so big uh, that we need to do something. But I think also it's it's more viable that way, mm. right? So you ask the schools or um, you know companies mm -hmm. or factories to have their own mm -hmm. uh, AI set of principles and mm -hmm. and uh, and so on. Um, but this can't be in isolation, right? I mean, at a certain yeah. point, we need to have a, mm -hmm. like a, a set of principles that will apply to everyone. Who's going to take the lead? Should it be the government? Itong private, pri private, public, academic. Should it be academe? I mean, it's just uh, <laughs> thinking aloud. What do we want to hope for? Mm -hmm. should, it, should it be? Um, um, so I would well, say, certainly not the not, not the robots. We don't want them to. Oh take yeah, the definitely. <laughs> and then someone has to just to take charge. Uh, even if it, if it, even if it looks like you're passing the torch. So let's say mm -hmm. private sector pilots it, or an industry association like the AAP yeah. starts yeah. it, pilots it because we are faster that way. We yeah. can mobilize things mm -hmm. faster, and, and groups and stakeholders we can identify mm -hmm. who needs to be involved faster. Mm -hmm. Then we pass the, the torch to, let's say, a public sector. Maybe, I don't know which particular agency, let's say the DICT. Mm -hmm. So um, if we, I, I'm not really familiar with the history of how the Data Privacy Act eventually got into, mm -hmm. you know, uh, but uh, who started that if it was triggered by the private sector. But uh, it's not necessarily a path that may apply in this case. Uh, for, for me, it's not like we need to have like something like an NPC, but eventually we don't want that violators of AI regulations, if they will be put in place, will just be penalized. Mm -hmm. I think that's more, should be more than that, right? Mm -hmm. um, so it is it is bigger than, than that, but if it we leave it up to one sector, let's say uh, the government to figure things out, definitely they cannot, they need the experts, they need the experienced uh, practitioners, and they also need a lot of connections with, uh, you know, outside agencies and in other organizations, right, who are really more on the, um, not just policy making, but a lot of the, a lot of the technology uh, knowledge and, and awareness and understanding really has to be there as well. Um, if you do put up a regulatory body or a task force, then you will also need an auditor then they cannot be in the same place. Mm -hmm. So it's when it comes to owning um, whatever needs to come out of the, let's say, the roadmap or an implementation plan, I don't think it cannot be just one sector. So if, it, if there is, uh, I think there was a, um, one of the politicians who suggested that there's a task force, an AI task force, right? Mm -hmm. So if that happens, then um, it's not necessarily like a, a, a long-term um plan to just have a task force because it may even need to be like mm -hmm. an own agency mm -hmm. uh, eventually. But definitely the private sector will need to be very active there in the, the academic sector um, and all industries represented. So it's it's a big task, but it, you know, I would say it's the, it is still possible. Just, just a quick uh, uh, follow-up. Is there some sort of deadline, natural or otherwise, that Mm. We're la actually laboring under. Like, mm. uh, I wouldn't. I wouldn't think of a hard deadline, mm -hmm. but it's really, it's relative to how other countries are doing. Mm -hmm. So we're we're really looking mm -hmm. at two moving goalposts. One goalpost, which everyone is looking at, is safety, mm -hmm. because these things can harm society. But the other goalpost is innovation, which is sort of a little yeah. more invisible. Mm -hmm. And the fear is always, at least in, in, in some sectors, is if you regulate or over-regulate, then you lose out. Mm -hmm. That's already the reaction to a lot of the, like the, the EU passed a preliminary act on AI, mm -hmm. which the members are all free to adopt. Uh, everyone's worried that, okay, we'll, if we're the first country to actually restrict AI use, that means we're, we're removing ourselves from the, in, from the race uh, you know, to benefit from AI. And for the case of the Philippines, there are significant uh, portions of our GDP that depend on, let's say, call centers, mm -hmm. manufacturing, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. even our OFWs, mm -hmm. all could be disrupted by AI. So I think it's in our best interest to, to really get on top of it and see how we can protect that. Otherwise, uh, never mind innovation yet, we lose whatever we've got now and we, we kind of shut ourselves from future potential benefits. Mm -hmm. So those are like two moving goalposts that we need to watch. I 
remember what you, what you said about cadence. No? So, so part of it is just, mm. just the speed mm -hmm. uh, of uh, evolution of, of, of new development. Uh, it's really hard to, uh, to play catch up. Uh, yeah. Let's, let's uh, uh, have two specific examples. Uh, I'll start with uh, Michelle. Um, a positive example of uh, generative AI uh, I just found out from Doc that to make a syllabus or a course outline mm -hmm. uh, on any subject whatsoever, you can you can just go to uh, I think it's Learning Studio AI to create it in a matter of minutes. Ninety seconds. Ninety <laughs> one hundred twenty seconds. And and, yeah. and then, yeah, surely that's a good thing, right? So how, how should mm -hmm. we think about that? That's those are the that's an example, very specific example of innovation. Um, mm -hmm. At, from the from the teacher from the educator's point of view, mm -hmm. that's something that is really has really been a pain for me, mm -hmm. and uh, I do a lot of administrative work mm -hmm. uh, on top of that. Mm -hmm. But that is really why I teach, right? Um, and now it's automated. Mm -hmm. So first, I guess that there is relief mm -hmm. that okay, um, you know, I, I I have help. But then eventually, I think it will also sink in that okay, now what is my value if what all my years of experience in this particular field uh, can now be, you know, even improved by, by an AI. So now what is my value as, as an educator? So uh, am I meant to, even if, even if the administrative tasks can be automated, so mm -hmm. what am I here for? So, you know, I'm just here to police the kids in your classroom, right? So I think in, 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 all, um, in all technologies that, that have... Uh, come and you know stabilized basically. Um, there's there's that um, you know point of acceptance that okay I need to first I need to use it mm -hmm. and then eventually I realize okay this is helping me this is not helping me and then what is left for me to do right? Um, it is a positive thing in the sense that um, all individuals I would say um, get to explore a higher level or a higher value for themselves mm -hmm. right? Where else can I add? value mm -hmm. but um you know in reality check how many of us filipinos are really seeing this as uh a, an opportunity for them to level up right so we we hear more of uh people getting scared of mm -hmm. losing their jobs and then government please help us mm -hmm. please protect us mm -hmm. right so we don't hear a lot of those who are really exploring to better themselves or finally I can get onto more meaningful things. Yeah, right. there, there, we, we talk a lot about narratives, uh, especially in politics, but I think that's also applicable to this field. Uh, that should be part of the narrative also, yeah. like some yes. of the, the, the stuff, that the, the good stuff that we can yeah. put together because of AI. But, you know, sorry, back to fear mongering. <laughs> <laughs> uh, let's, talk about, uh, let's talk of a negative example. Let's say deep fake. Mm -hmm. uh, it's very easy now to, to create something out of uh, thin air mm -hmm. and you're ruining somebody's reputation and so on. How should we think about that talk? I think f fundamentally, eventually, um, I, I don't, I'm not seeing it yet, but mm -hmm. I think eventually people will have to kind of reorient their attitude towards whatever they see online. Because we've, we've been, we've had what, at least two, two maybe three decades mm -hmm. of kind of allowing the online experience, social media, to take over kind of our, the real life experience. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know this as a journalist. Mm -hmm. So we've had that uh, kind of direct, uh, direction or trajectory. Now we have to sort of stop, and I don't know if we do a 180, because now what we're seeing online will be infiltrated and proliferated by basically manufactured content. Mm -hmm. It doesn't necessarily mean it's bad content, but it's not content written by humans. That's fundamentally a, a big change. Mm -hmm. so, so we need to be aware now that moving forward, a lot of what we read online could have been done by an AI, maybe at the behest of a human, and the intent will be murkier. You know, that was always the challenge with deep fakes. How do you know if John Nery really said this? And my advice was always look at the intent. If John Nery is saying something that doesn't seem like something John Nery would say, then you filter. But it's now, very philosophical. Yeah, yeah, but <laughs> yeah, it's attacking Doc Ligot for that, for that matter. But now, AI could do it in a way that, just say, do it in the way John Nery would do it. So now there's no way uh, to mm -hmm. tell. So I think there, there may be this counter movement towards, okay, let's not trust 100% what we see online. We now need to start 
uh, talking to actual real people. I've seen that a little bit of that come through, come through some of the news that people are now seeking actual, tangible, tactile experiences outside of the online domain. Partly driven by this uh, trend that everything is now manufactured. But then, to double down on what uh, Michelle said, there is an there is an interim opportunity for people during this transition period. Mm -hmm. Okay, I'm a copywriter rather than fear for my my job. I'll just 10x my copywriting output, mm -hmm. and I'll make a little bit of money on the side uh, if I do that. And uh, graphics, video, the same way. I think it's really the guardrails that uh, are throwing us off. Mm -hmm. If there's no way to know if uh, a manufactured image, it's not like altered images once upon a time. If mm -hmm. an image was altered, you can in a way detect yeah. there was a, someone changed it or superimposed a face on it. Now the whole thing is completely manufactured. Yeah. And you have to clearly state this is satire. So the rules on that, it's really tempting for potential regulation on uh, you know, uh, you know, free speech if, we, if we're not careful. I think that the pervasiveness is really the challenge. Anyone can do it with very, very little resources. That reminds me of what you said. Uh, really, one of the highlights of last week's National Summit was that session on creatives. Mm -hmm. um, because especially the visual artists, I think, yeah. I think they'll, they'll have a rougher time uh, mm -hmm. now, uh, I mean, in the very near future, than let's say even journalists, although we don't particularly see it as a bright, uh, future. I mean, we, we, we still have to uh, work our way through that. But mm -hmm. the visual artists, I think uh, mm -hmm. they, they will be under a lot of uh, pressure. Um, I was struck by something that Professor Ben Tihanki said uh, in the summit. Uh, he said, he offered two guideposts. He said, alignment and safety. Mm -hmm. uh, you have to make sure that the AI tech is aligned with uh, human values, with priorities, and so on. And you have to certify it as safe. Uh, maybe we can spend the last few minutes just talking about uh, that. So you, how do you, can, can we have a test case, like uh, certifying something as safe? Uh, mm -hmm. how, how do we do that? Um, what should be, I mean, I can, I, can, I can really see AAP taking the lead there. Mm -hmm. uh, how can we do that? Well, there are inspirations from existing like standards, mm -hmm. like one of the things we're reviewing right now is how do we implement like ISO type standards yeah. for AI? Yeah. Okay, and that's based on global consensus, right. which give you some yeah. some comfort. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, even if you had standards, how would you use them? Mm -hmm. And maybe we can use uh, you know privacy as an example. Mm -hmm. uh, there's this privacy impact assessment mm -hmm. instrument. That's not necessarily a hard regulation. You don't have to do it but many people use it as part of procurement. So in a way, it safeguards the implementation of these mm -hmm. systems. Yeah. It doesn't stop bad systems from getting implemented, but at least you have some accountability. So maybe that route is a, a viable one for AI. Mm -hmm. So it's not so much curtailing research, which is the kind of the double-edged blade. If you yeah. restrict research, you lose out on innovation. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but so by all means, do your research. But you will not be able to implement that in a large scale, like in a public uh, company or a public organization or a, even a private sector organization without fulfilling some sort of a checklist. I think that's a good, in a way, compromise. Mm -hmm. And at the same time, it really begs the creation of, uh, I guess AAP can be the seed of it, but we really need multilateral yeah. cooperation here because no one can claim to have like 100% you sure. know, impact or knowledge of this. Mm -hmm. And sectors that, uh, as Michelle said, previously unrepre unrepresented sectors need to speak up. Yeah. Creatives is one. Yes. Uh, of course, schools, uh, jobs, labor is another. Mm -hmm. And I think um, more than just jobs, I think it, it has something to do with, you know, society at large. How do, we, how do we police this stuff? Who do you complain to? Even in privacy issues, mm -hmm. most people actually are at a loss. Do they approach the police? Do they go to the NPC? How mm -hmm. far does that go? As opposed to kind of more, I would say, familiar crimes where, you know, it's a clear cut. I'm going to go to court and sue this person. Uh, AI is kind of a murky thing. Well, the good news is I, I think UP Law has started to release a series of uh, uh, legal legal courses. Mm -hmm. It's actually open to non-lawyers where they're, they're looking at potential uh, legal dimensions to AI. Mm -hmm. So I'm, I was very happy uh, yeah. to hear that. Mm -hmm. These are like new things that we need to start talking about if we want to approach that kind of, kind of level of safety. Mm -hmm. How about alignment with human values, you know, human priorities? 
How should we think about that? <laughs> Uh, even before AI, I don't think we are able to, to safeguard uh, mm -hmm. right, uh, human values and uh, make sure that it's aligned with any other system that's implemented. Mm -hmm. So going back to the previous uh, applications that's on the related technologies such as analytics and data science, uh, discriminating algorithms, mm -hmm. right, even mm -hmm. if it's not as pervasive, but they're there. And no one really is able to, to check for alignment. Um, let's say, for example, the, through the BSP, it, it becomes part of regulations to make sure that uh, the loan applicants are not discriminated against. For mm -hmm. example, um, they, there are you know, regulations mm -hmm. that, that they have to comply. So it, they are explicitly written. But you don't have that for all industries. Mm -hmm. right? Why? I don't know. Maybe they feel it is not as important. Mm -hmm. right? But uh, let's, let's, uh, if we take the example of, maybe this is a stretch, but let's say um, knowledge of, uh, you know, communicating that when you receive a text, you know if it is a scammer or not, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. right? Um, so first of all, that's a violation of your data privacy because someone got your number, mm -hmm. right? But to, you, to the end user, it's just, okay, someone texted me. If I had known better, I know I would know that this is a scammer and I will not give my details, right? Or I will not click on the link. But still, some people do not know any better and then they go ahead and click the link and send their OTP, right? So it's if we are, if that is our peg, that we can somehow control mm -hmm. um, AI and make sure it is safe and it is not harming anyone, if we go to that, if we imagine that as a, a future. Uh, way of protecting everyone. It, it still boils down to education and awareness. Mm -hmm. We, you know, like right now, everyone says, okay, do not click on the link, right? Do not give your number to anyone. So if it has to get to those levels, I think we should, right? We should. Uh, but again, it is information that we need on how AI works, uh, working through the schools and then the schools, the educators, educating the students, however young they are, because now this is really going to affect everyone, right, of all ages, right? So same goes with um, not just educational institutions, but at the, at the workplace, it has to be part of the digital literacy courses that, that are, uh, you know, for new employees and, and all that. So it, it, uh, it, it's basic information, right? Uh, so this is data and these are algorithms and the, the AI can use all your content if you put it online, you know, stuff like that. Uh, it doesn't need to be, you know, you have a PhD and this is, mm -hmm. this is what you need to learn AI, right? But use of AI, how do people use AI and make best use of it? So going back to the discussion mm -hmm. uh, among the creatives, mm -hmm. what, what I liked about it is when we had the pre-panel briefing mm -hmm. before the summit, uh, that's when we heard for the first time their, their side of it. And instead of being alarmed for them, which we all were, mm -hmm. right, before the summit, we, we heard that they were actually having fun using it mm -hmm. and wanting to know how best to use AI tools. Mm -hmm. So that was the ask. I said, please share that in the summit, that that is what you need. You know, people do not need to be scared for you that your mm -hmm. jobs will be replaced. But... We need to uh, assemble ourselves, our best, you know, educators and communicators, and also share or how to laymanize the use of AI, right? Mm -hmm. uh, so I think that's a, a pretty powerful weapon or tool against, you know, to protect our, ourselves. Right? Mm -hmm. Information always, always the key. Maybe as a last question, I'll ask the same thing of you. Um, I got the impression. I got the impression from attending the summit and then now from uh, listening to you that well there are two things uh, at play here one is the this ecosystem that mm -hmm. you're building uh, that allows the possibility of a collective response mm -hmm. but also on top of that there is an opportunity for individuals or uh, institutions to take the leadership role mm -hmm. in other words we don't need to depend on the government or yeah. Big tech or whatever, yeah. right? So, yeah. UP Law might have something you know very specific, but uh, can help that particular uh, issue, but maybe applicable to other mm -hmm. issues, right? Mm -hmm. uh, AAP might you know do something, and then again has so it it, it 
I see that. No? So there's that ecosystem, mm -hmm. which I did not really appreciate until today. Mm -hmm. uh, but on top of that, there's, a, there's an opportunity for individuals and institutions to mm -hmm. uh, take the lead. Um, how do you feel about that? I'll, I'll start with Doc, and then we'll end with me. I think in, in, in a nutshell, this is just, I guess, uh, uh, the more modern uh, example of a shift to a more, I would say, organic approach mm -hmm. to, to safety or mm -hmm. to regulation. Where we're all, when we're all bred under kind of a monolithic model where mm -hmm. an authority dictates mm -hmm. on everyone. And we keep clashing uh, against this kind of this new... I mean, we experienced it with the shift from like Britannica to Wikipedia. Mm -hmm. I mean, we, we really didn't believe a volunteer-led encyclopedia mm -hmm. would, would survive. Mm -hmm. And now it's pretty much eliminated all of the monolithic encyclopedias. I think it's, it's the same philosophy. AI is just kind of that on steroids. And again, maybe one thing that we probably need to get more used to is we're used to something very inert like regulation that doesn't change a lot like the definition of theft will always be theft forever mm -hmm. but the definition of copyright may not be the same so this is kind of the new thing uh, and even technology something one thing about technology is you never anticipate kind of the downsides until you released it in the wild like I mean we, we, we all know how social media started out as a place to share photos and poke friends with and then it became a marketing tool it's not a bad idea. And now we're all trapped. And now we're trapped. <laughs> and the polarization for me is just a symptom of that's really what it does. It segments populations. It didn't necessarily occur to us that part of that segmentation is hate and disinformation. It's just doing its job. So we have to find a way to get kind of get over that transition and also assign accountability. I think that's one thing that's in a way evaded mm -hmm. uh, more modern discussions on mm -hmm. technology impacts. We we have so far been unable to assign account blame yes but we, we haven't been able to make technology accountable so i think the, this discussion on micro regulation and mm -hmm. accountability and transparency is a step towards that mm -hmm. and the ecosystem approach probably is good because no one needs to be ordered to speak up you know you bring it up everyone considers it and the whole thing changes of course that's over and on top of what the government could do or mm -hmm. or, or not do as the case may be uh, but it's better than zero. Maybe in the in the future, governments may be that way also. Mm. Yeah. And Michelle? Uh, I think it's uh, really looking at what has happened in the past and how we mm -hmm. have tried to, you know, regardless of support from, from government or big, big tech or big companies, we persevered to educate uh, everyone on analytics and data science, mm -hmm. different job roles were created and frameworks. And then, you know, bit by bit, we we had we saw that we can make a difference. I mean, it was a group of geeky practitioners who just got alarmed that mm -hmm. there's not enough supply mm -hmm. of data practitioners in the Philippines uh, five years ago, right? It was just us. So what what we're saying is this is now we keep saying it's IR 4.0 and the future is really tech, right? So what this means for us is things are just going to be faster and faster. And the, the change that is needed and the regulations and everything else, the education that, mm -hmm. that, 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 that's needed will just need to be, uh, you know, we, we just need to be very practical about it and not just uh, wait for government to act because, um, you know, that's, that's uh, really going to take a lot of time. But as you said, it is new. It will just continue to be new. Imagine that. It's, it's not just chat GPT now. I mean, in the next six months, it's GPT-10. I don't know, mm -hmm. right? So it's just going to be more and more of those things. And if we keep on waiting for government to make a plan around it, you know, can I, right? can I punctuate that? Um, one thing people I forget is that regula regu regulations are rarely anticipatory. You know, regulations mm. occur, mm -hmm. for the most part, once something has gone wrong or something mm -hmm. has been abused. Yeah. And I think for the most part, society has survived those abuses long enough to be regulated. And I think the fear is if we do that approach again and mm -hmm. AI being pervasive as it is, uh, might not be the opportunity to regulate yeah. anything eventually if these right. things go really wild. Yeah. So anticipatory approaches, yeah. regulation is probably not the best place. Eventually it will occur. And, and where I would uh, actually, which I would use 
to call on the experts mm -hmm. as well in their respective fields, fields mm -hmm. like UP Law. Yeah, we we had someone represent uh, the legal side of things, even Antonio Santiago. Antonio yeah. Santiago, mm -hmm. right? Uh, we have someone represented by Dr. Benti Hanke mm -hmm. coming from the business ethics, mm -hmm. which is not AI ethics, but mm -hmm. he's been there for mm -hmm. longest time, right? Mm -hmm. So we just want to call on the experts to assemble. Parang Marvel, <laughs> ano, yo. Oh, oh. But to, to attack this thing and, and be prepared for, for these things, anticipate these things because th these are the experts who will know, right, when things are coming and how it's going to evolve or how it may look like, right, mm -hmm. if you don't act on it. But aside from that, we also want to cascade it to as many people as we, we want. So we're not building this pool of experts because it it's not, you know, it's it doesn't it cannot be very elitist, right? Mm -hmm. No, we just need to have all these perspectives represented, mm -hmm. and then we need communicators, like maybe you know, like media, mm -hmm. to sort of how do you cascade these messages to the rest of the people? Mm -hmm. um, let's say the message is do not be afraid of ChatGPT or or what, right? Mm -hmm. Or use it to the best, you know, uh, how it was designed or whatever. Mm -hmm. So even simple things like that need to be. Uh, put out there, and maybe the tech experts aren't the best people to communicate that. <laughs> but we are here to educate, yes, definitely. But to communicate it to the to the masses, I think that's that's also very key. I have so many more questions, but uh, we've run out of time. Thank you, uh, Ms. Michelle Alarcon of the Analytics Association of the Philippines, and uh, Doc Ligot of uh, Data Ethics PH. Your pioneering work in such a complicated field fraught with implication is a service to the public square. Thank you again. Thank you. That's it for us tonight. The next step for engaged citizens is always to take a more active part, perhaps with the help of AI, in rebuilding our democracy. See you in the public square. This is John Neri. Thank you and good night. Thank you.